Welcome to another episode of Wu Blockchain Podcast. Today, I'm pleased to have Philip from Elixir, which is slowly becoming the bastion of Oracle style perp dexes. Hey, Philip, uh, since we're coming here, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited for the chat. So, for the audience who aren't familiar with uh, Elixir and yourself, could you please give a quick intro of uh, your background and what problem is Elixir solving? Yeah, definitely. So I've been in crypto since 2016 when I started the Carnegie Mellon Blockchain Group. Um, I was the president there until I graduated from CMU. I ran a company for called Block Venture for a little over two years, um, up until around two and a half for three years ago when I sold that to go all in on Elixir. Um, we essentially, the, the problem that we're solving for Elixir is that fundamentally order book exchanges have no way to bootstrap liquidity. Right, so it's it's there's no trustless way for retail people to come in and get involved and supply liquidity to an order book pair. Right, if you're an order book based exchange um, or you're a protocol that is listed on an order book based exchange, you need to go through like one of the big four or five large centralized market making names and pay one of these firms like an arm and a leg to actually provide liquidity on that pair. And so Elixir is a modular DPoS network built to power order book liquidity, essentially allowing for anyone to supply liquidity to order books. And so what that means, the way to kind of high level conceptualize Elixir, similar to how the AMM curves, what, what AMM curves are to Uniswap is what Elixir is to order books, right? And so um, we essentially have native integrations with over 30 of the, of the largest order book based exchanges, um, you know, mostly on the DeFi side. Uh, we actually have a couple on the centralized exchange side too, which we'll be announcing soon, but um, Essentially, the way that it works, right? People can come in, they can supply liquidity directly to a pair. Um, our protocol is maker only. We run um, a very, essentially, the Uniswap V2 X times Y's with a K curve equivalent for order books, offering a very similar risk return profile for LPs who can just come in, they can just one click supply liquidity to a pair um, and earn a share of these long term liquidity provider incentives that these exchanges are already paying out. So essentially, um, the, yeah, the way it would work, a lot of times you can interact with Elixir without even knowing it, right? You go onto Vertex, for example, and via Vertex Fusion, which is their native feature powered by Elixir, you just, you'll see a buy button, you'll see a sell button, you see a supply button, you press supply, and then on the back end, your funds go to a smart contract that lives on Arbitrum, um, in Vertex's case, um, but usually on, on the, the chain, wherever the perp dex or order book based dex uh, settles to. Um, our protocol is connected into Vertex via WebSockets and APIs, updating orders once a second, um, issuing signatures based on the funds held in that smart contract. So the whole, per the whole uh, process is fully permissionless, right? So when you supply liquidity to that pair, you, are, you maintain control of your funds at all times. It's fully permissionless, it's fully trustless. You can see exactly how your liquidity is going to be provisioned. You can claim your accrued rewards in real time in, in the actual Vertex interface. And then you press withdraw, the funds go back into your account. So that's the super high level of Elixir, my background, what we're building, but happy to dive in. Nice. I have so many questions because Elixir, I think from a high level is a to be business. It's not something that, you know, daily crypto users interact with um, unless they want to provide LP, right? So my first question is, how like, how much does the market size for the market makers for the centralized market makers? Just the um, the 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 top thesis I heard was um, obviously it's very hard for the perp access to bootstrap liquidity and is obviously a very little risk business. Right? It's one of the, the the biggest use cases uh, in crypto or um, in in the among dApps. Um, does it like give a overall like an estimation or how much uh, how big is the the market size that you guys are tapping into? Yeah, I think people actually underestimate from the outside. A lot of people just look at the high level of like, oh, like for, I mean, just specifically on the size of, of order book based exchanges, people will look and they'll be like, oh, well, I trade on like Uniswap or whatever, right? But all of these AMMs are moving to order book style exchanges, right? You saw with Uniswap, they had Uniswap V2, right? Which is simple X times Y is equal to K curves. Then they had V3, right? And then, you know, you can now set bands and limits, right? And now you have V4, you have hooks, you have limit orders on, on Uniswap, right? You have the, like these, the, you have Uniswap X, right? You have, so essentially things are moving very aggressively towards an on-chain, like order book 
model on chain. And I think the reason for that is that it offers the least amount of, um, it's, it's the most efficient trading environment. And you have the ability to really have, and, and what I mean by that, you can take a dollar and you can turn it over multiple times a day, right? Like you look at the, the volume on Vertex versus the amount of the actual TVL that's on there or DYDX or Hyperliquid, right? Like these guys are doing billions of dollars a day when they're doing it with like less than a hundred million, a lot of times of actual on the books liquidity. And so every dollar is turning over multiple times a day. So there's a lot of like, obviously there's uh, perpetuals are very lucrative for an exchange to adopt. Um, you know, if you're just an AMM, right. And you just handle one swap every now and again from a user, it's much more lucrative for you to go and actually enable leverage, right? Because now a user is coming in and they're, they're longing and they're shorting and they're doing it with 10 X their size. Right. And like, you know, you can earn off the liquidations, you know, on some, some exchanges, right. Like, if, you know, that's kind of like a, like a, a, a trope, but essentially I think the, the market, all of these large AMMs. Okay. Here's an, another example, synthetics. Synthetics is moving to an order book model, right? So if you look at the, on, on the optimism forums, they are building out an off-chain order book that will power Quenta and all of these other exchanges that are on top of the synthetics network, right? And so like a lot of these AMM <clears throat> GLP style DEXs are all moving to order books. And it's because that's, you, you can't even have like APIs, like you need an off-chain off -chain order book, right? You know, otherwise you're, you're broadcasting things on chain and there's MEV and it's cost money to update your transactions. And then there's, you know, then, Market makers have to quote wider, right? So pretty much, um, I would say that the, the, the industry is moving quite heavily towards order book based exchanges. I think Elixir's, I mean, Elixir's market is, is actually one of the largest in crypto. I mean, trading is the largest use case, um, or it's just speculating in crypto is like, has been the most successful use case thus far. So it'll be interesting to see where the industry goes though. Yeah. Um, where does Elixir's revenue coming from? I think there's probably different um, different uh, avenues. One part is obviously uh, the trading fee, but uh, if you're just uh, you know supplying bid ass on the further side, you, you probably won't hit, won't be hit. Um, is is there going to be another uh, like a fee payment from from those part taxes to it, sir? No. So we 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 don't charge the actual exchanges. The way that so. Currently, there is no fee or anything live, right? This is something that um, our DAO can vote um, long term to turn on a fee switch. Um, there are a couple ways in which this fee switch could look. The first one could be through a spread, right? Imagine that instead of quoting at a 0.15% spread, we quote at a 0.18% spread. And that 0.03 could go to our protocol as a validator security fee. And so that, that is like, that's like one example, right? And that doesn't actually charge the LP who supply liquidity, right? The LP who supply liquidity isn't paying that. It's the taker who's coming in and trading against the order that is paying that fee, right? Because they're eating a slightly worse execution, right? The downside there is obviously that you're, you're not actually, uh, you, you're not picking up as much volume, right? So the wider out you quote, right? The less fees you're earning. So there's a natural kind of like optimization curve that's there. Um, and, you know, we're talking to a lot of the leading guys, like obviously like Gauntlet and um, Chaos, guys like that um, around the, the modeling there. But I think that the, um, yeah, so that's like one way that it could work, right? Where you're essentially charging the actual, you're charging the actual takers who are trading against the orders. Um, at, the second thing could be, obviously, we, we have this ELX ETH, uh, cross-chain liquidity provider token that is live. Um, you know, there's, there's ways for the DAO to, to stake that Ethereum, right. And then route it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of revenue sources there. We have a new, um, really big announcement, which we'll be, um, pushing out in the next month or so. And there's tons of ways to obviously monetize. So there's tons of ways that you'll be able to monetize. Um, but yeah, there's no plan to actually charge the exchanges themselves. Got it. Um, for the users who are interested in Elixir today, what are the ways that they can participate? Of course, you guys haven't released the token, so I'm sure it's, uh, uh, it's going to be a very curious uh, question for our viewers. Yeah. So, I mean, Elixir solves a few pain points for a few different parties. The easiest way to get involved is to supply liquidity to um, 
is, is to supply liquidity to one of these native integrations, right? So um, th these are their own products that these exchanges have, right? So RabbitX has their FAMM, Vertex has Vertex Fusion, Bluefin has Bluefin Nexus. We're going live with Apex uh, in the next week or so. Um, orderly Network is going live. Um, we currently have that slated for the 25th, I believe, of this, of this month. Um, so you'll be able to just one click supply liquidity to their order books. And then yeah, our protocol will actually like build up the order books, right? Like layer the bids, asks updating once a second. Um, and essentially that's like probably the easiest way to get involved. Um, we have a, our version of a points program called the Apothecary, right? So everything Elixir themed, it's all uh, potions and, uh, you know, uh, like wizards and Apothecary is, is kind of like along that same lines. Um, but essentially, we reward. Uh, we're, we're tracking all of the different users' contributions to the network through this potions through, through potions. Um, uh, there's ways to obviously get involved there with like creating content, and we have like a private Telegram channel um, with a larger like lounge channel. Um, and so we have like rituals that we do where people can can come in and create content. Um, so uh, you know, we have um, some of those highlighted on our our Twitter, but. Um, yeah, that's so that th th those are just a few ways to get involved. But generally, supplying liquidity to one of these native integrations is one of the best. Um, supplying ETH to ELX ETH is another great way to get involved too. Is there any impermanent loss for ELX ETH, like currently, supplying no. US USDC? Currently, currently there is no uh, ELX ETH impermanent loss because the ETH is pretty much just in like it, it is like essentially just in like a one-way multi-sig. It's like very similar to Blast. The, 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 those funds are not being utilized right now. Um, the downside with that is that you have to lock funds until mainnet, which is in August. So um, there is a potion boost associated with that, but um, it really comes down to the end user. I think um, with USDC, yeah, there, there is the risk for permanent loss as in, as is like with, it's very similar. You can almost conceptualize it as like supply and liquidity via Uniswap, right? Like, you know, the, you know, the if you were to put in like a hundred dollars, right? It could be a hundred and two, it could be ninety-eight, it could be ninety-five. Like it, it fluctuates slightly, um, similar to like a GLP, right? It's a good way to think about it. Um, but yeah, you'll be earning the exchange incentives over time, and that's generally what people are supplying for. Um, where it's like, look, if you're earning like forty percent on on a pool, eating a couple percent like here and there, it's like you know, it, it could be worth it, right? And then um, sometimes, you know, it's, you, you end up earning a little bit of money because like, the trade fees outweigh the, the you know, any impermanent loss there. So um, yeah, but for ELXE, there's, there's, there's no risk um, on the impermanent loss side right now. Got it, got it. Um, if you can just describe a user journey to how a user deposits their USDC on Elixir, uh, to, um, you know, how Elixir, um, then uses that fund to the different, uh, perp dexes that the user desired. Uh, obviously there, um, each perp dexes are on a different chain, right? There's, uh, yeah. a one on Sui, there's the ADS who has its own chain. Uh, how, how does it work from probably just like a tech level? Yeah. So there's two different components here. There's the actual stack. Um, of of the the Elixir network here. I'll move my arm, so my, I'm not vibrating. <laughs> but um, yeah, so essentially, there's the actual network that Elixir has built up, um, and then there's the flow of funds. So funds never actually move onto the Elixir network. It's like something that's important to note. Um, so real high level on our stack, we have a uh, yeah, we have a modular DPoS network that is purpose built for this use case. So. Our network comes to consensus once a second. We currently have 14,000 validators in our testnet v2. Comes to consensus once a second, updating all the orders across all the exchanges, um, and then essentially posting fraud proofs to Ethereum mainnet. So if a validator, say it, there's 14,000 validators, the top 100 actually participate in consensus. Say that one of them says something malicious, they get jailed, um, they fall out of the validator set, another one of the 14,000 gets subbed in, um, and then, and that's weighted by total stake. Um, and then there's a fraud, a fraud proof posted on Ethereum mainnet to slash that validator. And so that's the high level on the back end, how, how things look. Um, our protocol plugs into the exchanges. Um, so if you, if you were to look at our docs, there's like a, a helpful diagram, but essentially our network plugs into the exchanges. We pull 
the via WebSocket, we pull the state of the order books. Um, we come to consensus. We then send, we create those orders through a cryptographic order proposal. We all then sign the, all the validators sign the, the order proposal, then that gets sent off to the exchanges. So that whole process happens once a second. Um, the actual flow of funds ne never touches the network itself. So the funds stay on the chain. Users, when they supply, it's, and this is like pretty important, that when user supplies to a certain pair, they're supplying to a certain pair on a certain exchange, right? Unless, so like with Apex, for example, they're building out their own, like one place that they can supply and it'll route on the back end to all of the pairs on Apex. But usually for, for the exchanges that are live, on the back end, everything is per pair per exchange. It's very similar to Uniswap. You, when you supply, you're supplying to a certain pair, right? So, um, and it's maker only. We're not like arbing to Binance or anything like that. You're just supplying liquidity to that exact pair. Um, so when a user presses supply, the funds go into a smart contract. Our protocol is issuing signatures based on the funds held in that smart contract. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, like the, the, the goal is like, yeah, like long term, like we couldn't even access, like even if, you know, we're all in a plane and we get shot out of the sky, right? The protocol continues to run. We couldn't access these funds if we wanted to. That's, you know, that's, and that's really the vision kind of for Elixir. And as it stands today, we actually, that's, that's how it works. Like we couldn't access those funds. Um, and so we're issuing signatures based on the funds there. Um, the users will see themselves accruing rewards. They can claim rewards. They press withdraw, the funds go back into their account. Users can enter through one of two ways. They can either join through the actual front ends of the exchange. So like, for example, if you go to RabbitX, um, they have a tab for Fusion and you press that and then you'll see all of the different pools um, and you can supply liquidity to an individual pool. And then um, you'll see your rewards accruing. You'll be able to track the health of that pool, like you know the APR um, reward wise. Um, and then you press withdraw, the funds go back into your account. Um, so, but yeah, we also have a like community endorsed aggregator page, which lists all the pools. Um, but that's something that we're, you know, we'll have, but it's not going to be like the main like place for people to go because I mean, we have, then it's like, okay, well, when we go live with Hyperliquid, they have like 150 pairs. DYDX wants fully permissionless markets where they want like 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 pairs, right? Like these guys want anyone to be able to spin up any market, just one click supply liquidity to it, powered by Elixir on the back end. Um, and earn a share of the taker fees for that market. Um, and that's only possible due to Elixir. But yeah, long term, you'll be able to, to, to generally access that through the actual exchange interfaces. But we also have an endorsed aggregator page too. So I was thinking about how you mentioned supplying uh, liquidity only in the form of like one currency USDC can be similar to a payout of uh, AMM uh, because obviously you need like two, two assets. Um, how because because it's an order book as well so i assume the impermanent loss is going to be less than uh if you're uh just simply using a uniswap v2 uh curve because well, think, you, you, you 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 would change the uh the bit ask constantly right well yeah exactly. from the spread so from the from the from the middle tail price. risk is is lower with a list elixir actually because the way if if a market were to sell to zero in an AMM pool, right? You're buying all the way down, right? Like you're just, you're consistently providing that liquidity. Um, Elixir does have risk mechanisms in place where it's like, essentially like you can never hold more than two, like, and we have all of this that's, um, that we've, we, we've like mentioned and publicized, but we'll be fully open source, obviously at our mainnet launch, um, with all of our code available. But essentially, yeah, like if you're holding more than two thirds inventory, we literally do not even place like a bid at that point. We're just aggressively like trying to offload inventory on the other side. So there's Got it. there are some risk mechanisms that are in, that are in play there, which are helpful. It is important to note that the reason that that those markets are one asset USDC only or USDT is because those are per, for perpetuals, and perpetuals are all denominated in stable coins, right? Um, usually, right? So when you supply like essentially you're buying you're longing contracts or selling contracts, but it's all in USDC. Um, for spot, we actually support spot markets too on the order book side. So for Vertex, you can see like one of our most popular pairs a lot of people have supplied to is USDT to USDC. And they just like, you know, a lot of people have supplied to that. And what that actually like, 
we, you actually have to supply both sides of the pair to those spot markets, right? So it's not just only one side, um, but the USDC, yeah, the, the USDC is because generally the perpetuals are denominated in, in USDC. For RabbitX, it's USDT. Um, for Apex, it's going to be USDT. Um, so it really depends on the exchange. Then, um, which is one, one thing I, uh, I just trying to figure out the logic. Like one thing is, uh, for example, when you supply like SUI USDC, right? Mm -hmm. If in a traditional uni V2 style, um, if SUI go up, you're, you're still making money, right? You're still, um, you're still making gains. It's just probably less than, uh, if you were to hold 50, 50, right? If you, if you didn't supply the LP, yeah. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out like, since you use USDC, you're yeah. on, on, on the water, but you're shorting SWE. So when the SWE price go up, you're only building up the short side of the SWE position so, because you don't own any SWE. How does that, how does that work? Yeah, that's a good question. So the main difference in the risk return is solely that you're in one year denominated in stables, right? Like, so if SWE goes up, you're not, capturing the up rise in SWE, right? Like if, if you were, if there's two pools, right? If there's SWE perp and then there's SWE to USDC, then you supply SWE and USDC and then SWE goes up. Like so when SWE goes up, you're making money holding SWE, right? Because half of your, what you've supplied is SWE. So you, you, you will always earn that, but you, you're, lo you're losing a little bit on the impermanent loss, right? For the USDC, it's, it's you're essentially like, yeah, you may have a permanent loss in that side, um, but you're not gaining from the uprise in sweep. But vice versa, right? Like it works the other way too. Where if SWE is nuking, right, it's going straight down, the the LP will end up a lot worse off in that SWE USDC side um, and the AMM because now half of their asset is worthless or whatever, right? And then you're denominated in the, uh, you're denominated in USDC on the other side, specifically on the other question that you had, which was like around like, oh, aren't you picking up con more and more on the way down? It's the same exact thing with the USDC, you, like SWE spot pool, right? You're buying SWE on the way down when you're an LP. You're, if you're perp, you're long on the way down. But uh, what Elixir does is it obviously like works to offload those contracts aggressively. And then the way to get into the mechanics of it, the way that, that the actual algorithm works, right? Is that, I mean, because it's the same, you, you can conceptualize it. AM, the X times Y is equal to K curve originally was modeled after Avelanita and Stoikov, like their basic how to like market make and take into account the, the actual inventory, right? So it's a very basic way to build up order book liquidity and essentially just like builds up buffers on like how much liquidity is on the books, what the volatility is, and then calculates an optimal bid ask, right? So as like, so yeah, essentially to, to, to bring it back, right? Like if you're buying inventory, right? What you do then, it's the same thing as sweet, right? Uh, spot, you're buying inventory on the way down, but the protocol becomes exponentially, it becomes exponentially harder and harder to fill another buy order as you've started picking up inventory. It's the same thing with like a Uniswap V2. Imagine that like when you, I don't know if you've traded against a pool that has a like near zero liquidity, but like it, it costs like it's, you're eating a huge amount of slippage just to extract every last dollar as Uniswap gets like closer and closer to zero, essentially, it becomes exponentially harder and harder to drain every last dollar out of that. And it's the same thing yeah. with Elixir where it's like, once you pick up a fill, sure, you have one long contract and Sui's going down, you have one. It's like, okay, well now to pick up another, like the, the long, the next time the long hits the books, it's twice as far. I didn't say that that one gets filled. Now it's like eight times as far, Like right? It's all the way down. And then the sell is like very aggressive, right? So it's, it, you can kind of conceptualize it back to the, the yeah. spot. It ends up being like quite equivalent. I don't know if that, that answers your question though. Yeah, then, then that's what I didn't get was like how how often do you guys change the uh, order book? Because if if the, if the case was like you guys change it like once a day or something like that, then it is the case. Or another case that is going to be like harder. It's almost going to be impossible to to hit the uh, you know the stream side of the of the bits and asks. 
Well, yeah, it's everything is calculated on like, it's like second to second, right? So there's rolling volatility buffers. Cause like, here's the thing, right? Cause if you want to take the goal for Elixir is that you can spin it up on BTC perp on Binance and it'll work great. And you can spin it up on the least liquid sand coin to Turkish Lira on gate or whatever, right? The most illiquid pair you can find and it'll work on both, right? So the way that it, that it does that is it calculates like, over time, it, it essentially pulls how much liquidity is on the books and the volatility and then quotes based on that, right? Because that's essentially what, all right, not to get too much into the theory of it, but since we were talking about this, when you think about an AMM, right? You, the USDT to USDC market on an AMM, right? Like say Uniswap, the fees are like super competitive as an LP, right? If you come in, because you could set your own L, your, your LP fee rate, Right. You could do 0 0.01, 0 0.05, 0 0.5, or 1%. Right. Everyone in USDT to USDC has 0 0.01. And the reason for that is that there's not a lot of losses for the, the market makers. Right. There's no one permanent loss. Right. People just, unless like one depegs, right. You're generally fine. Right. So there's not a lot of toxicity. So every, it's very competitive. Right. The equivalent, but, but then on the Uniswap side, if you look at ApeCoin, to USDT, which is like known, a lot of the market makers like use it as an example, is the most toxic, one of the most toxic pairs, right? Because no one knows how the hell to price ApeCoin, right? It could be worth like $10, could be worth a dollar, like no one knows what, how to price it. So there's huge swings. Every single LP over there, when you trade on ApeCoin, is trading at a, at a 1% fee for the, for the LPs, right? So you're not, I mean, because yeah, you're just going to get absolutely run over, right? If you go out there with like 0.05% fees, you're just never going to make any money, right? So the, the equivalent for that, for an order book, bringing this back, is that on USDT to USDC, the spread is very tight. It's the same. The spread is the equivalent to the LP fee. We, everything is very tight. If you look at like any market maker books, like any, any Binance, you go to any... It's a like very, very tight spreads. And you can put as much size as you want there because there's no loss, right? It's very like... Like it's the same thing, but if you're quoting on a super illiquid coin that has hot, super high volatility, like the, the buffers there calculate a much wider bid ask spread, right? And so that it's the spread on an order book is the same as the, as the fee rate that an LP will charge in a Uniswap pool. So anyways, that's, that's like, cool, I didn't cool. want to get too, some, too, too deep into it, but there's yeah, a lot of like, really you know, all it, yeah, it's very, it's very close. Yeah. So those things, if you never like deal with any market makers, like you never know. But since for the like we can get to know exactly like more, just more into these. Um, cool, cool. So yeah, um, I, I, I guess another thing was, uh, you you want to make sure that the liquidity that you have supplied uh is safe, like not to um not, to the point that you can not make money like you said but another thing is you want to make sure they are also competitive to make sure that you're generating enough fees for the the usdc uh to to the lps um how, how does how do you how, how do you, how does it let's sort of balance that so specifically you you want it to make money like you want the lps to be able to earn fees but at the same time you don't want to risk capital. Just to make sure I have the question down. That's, that's yeah, the exactly. That's, okay. that's my question. Yeah. So the, well, the cool thing is based on our last, what we were talking about earlier, you can calculate what the theoretical optimal bid ask spread should be using the amount of volatility and liquidity. And that's what this X times Y is equal to K curve equivalent does. That's like what it does. The, you then, what you want to do is you don't want to put the entirety there's like some game theory around, you don't want to put the entirety of, if there's a million dollars in a pool, you don't want to put it all like right at the top of the book, right? Like generally, so what market makers will do and uh, what Elixir does too, is that it, it, that's the optimal. And then you essentially, then you, that's one order level, but you'll have like eight, right? You essentially layer out the liquidity farther and farther out. And the goal for that, and this is something that exchanges really want to, right? They want to be able to, prevent cascading liquidations, right? Where like you want to have book like liquidity that is deeper on the books because there's also like a, a hidden element too, where exchanges, if they're paying Wintermute or like a big firm 
those guys have a very high cost of capital too. So they're like, look, we'll provide this, but we're going to put like 250K of liquidity on the books, right? We'll do it and, you know, assert, we'll take like 2% of your network supply in order to do that, right? But the, that, the exchange obviously wants them to be top of book, right? They're like, look, if you're, gonna, if you're only bringing 250K of liquidity, like we need that like super top of book, right? Because that's something that Elixir, we don't compete with Wintermute in that regard. Like we're never arbing to Binance and like being a taker and arb. Like that's something that like a sophistic, so sophisticated players are like specialized in. Um, but you know, we we're I mean, we're within 20, 30 basis points on most of the majors on like Vertex, for example. So we're we're quite competitive. But Elixir is trustless infrastructure to bootstrap yeah. liquidity to order books, right? And so they want the deeper books, but they don't want to pay a market maker to provide that. So Elixir is like a great solution for that too. And then for mid to long long tail assets, Elixir is like is the best and like only real solution for an order book based exchange. From like a cost to effectiveness perspective, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because when you talk to a market maker, like they'll, the, you will, you will say, "Look, I want like the the max liquidity that like one of these guys is going to bring is like two hundred fifty, five hundred k of liquidity, like per pair for like the top three, four pairs, and in exchange they want like two percent of your total supply, which is like a ton." Um, so, That's like dozens of millions of dollars, right? Yeah, for, exactly. For, they structure for, for it as a call for, option to the yeah. last round. Yeah, if it's they like, yeah, but it's tons of it's because there's no other option, right? If you're an exchange, you just have to pay it, right? There's you don't like, okay, great. Like, what? How else are you going to get liquidity? That's that's how they view it. And so, like, I don't, I don't. I mean, there's so much we can say on this. But the last thing I'll mention too is like with Vertex. Now they can be a lot more aggressive with like adding new markets, right? Because it used to be they had to go to a market maker. Hey, we'd love for you to provide liquidity to some like meme coin, right? That's hot. And they go, oh, well, you only, you know, we would have to revisit the commercials of the agreement. And, you know, uh, it's kind of hard. We can't orbit to Binance. And so it is not a good, but now they're like with Elixir, they could just spin up a new market, add some incentives, right? Like it's a, whatever, a thousand percent APR for the first dollar cents. So people are going to supply to it, right? And then they have one other market maker that just like arbs it to somewhere else is generally like, the, and then you're good, right? You have a new market. So cool. yeah, there's yeah. there's a lot of benefits unlocked there. Nice, nice. How has the uh, LP's performance looked like? Um, you guys obviously have so many different pairs on so many different perf taxes. Um, if you could just give a like a quick review or, or a rank of how this will look like um, in the past yeah. few months since you have so we, yeah, we, I mean we've been live for almost a year now. I mean we've been live for you know, on Vertex for since like it's like September of last year or something. So it's been I mean it's been like eight or nine months. Um, yeah, the pools are all essentially flat or slightly up for the most part. There's like, you definitely, because what generally, obviously like the, the spreads widen as volatility ticks up. So generally you're able to dodge most of the like two Sigma moves, right? Um, you know, where it's, I mean, we actually have, where if volatility is two, sig is two Sigma, you essentially just pull all orders, right? You just wait for volatility to cool back down. Um, so we have like pretty good risk measures, um, but when factoring in rewards, every pool is, I, I mean, I believe every single pool is up um, after factoring in rewards. Um, but yeah, there's obviously been times where like pools have been down like four or 5%. Um, and, and that's just, but it, I mean, at the end of the day, like that's, it's usually, and then when you look at those, those are usually on the like, most talks the, the pairs like similar to like an ape coin right they have like crazy like upswings downswings right so like like one example was like say network um like because btc like the B btc e like those are essentially like always like near flat or slightly up like there's those are just doing really well because we have like make we have rebates and zero maker fees obviously for all the volume so um it's not like they're like parties are paying any anything to the exchange on an ongoing basis and then they're they're making like i think the average apr on on bluefin is roughly like 35 percent right now um you know on, on rabbit x it's about 30 percent um and then i think vertex is a little bit lower it's probably like 15 percent um 20 percent but um but yeah essentially the yeah, yeah but usually like there was like one time for example that like say went on a crazy run um and there was like, so it's just like, obviously you're just like working to off the, the algos working to offload inventory on the way up. Right. Um,
but after factoring in all the the rewards, obviously, like all the LPs are still up net. Um, and then over okay. time, that actually is now back at flat. But it's just like it's one of those things where like it can like this is not it's not like riskless to supply liquidity. It's the same thing with Uniswap, right? Like we actually compared our performance to Uniswap for say to USDT on Uniswap and figured and saw that it was literally identical. It was like oh, they're down four percent. Elixir is down four percent on this crazy rise. Um, but at least the LPs in Elixir were being paid to provide that liquidity, right? And so they were net up, um, you know, all, all things considered, if, if they had their funds in there for a certain amount of time, right? Because obviously if you just deposit and then withdraw, it's hard to calculate. But um, yeah, it's been, it's been pretty, I mean, yeah, there, there hasn't been any issues um, on the p side. Cool. Everything is like flat or slightly up. Do you see a future where like Elixir holders or Elixir LPs, there's this 2% network tokens from uh, Probdesis instead of uh, who they're paying today, you know, the centralized market makers. Do, 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 do you see, do you think that will, uh, that will happen? Well, it is happening, right? I think that's oh. already something that with these, these rewards are coming from these exchanges. Like Elixir is not paying for any of this, right? So these, these are tokens that would have gone to a market maker generally or through a part of their existing long-term market making program. Like, like generally, if you're an order book exchange and you do a market maker program, you're paying out like two to three hundred percent APR for every dollar that a market maker brings, right? But then by integrating Elixir, you're now freeing that market for order book liquidity. So now anyone can just supply liquidity and earn a share of these incentives, right? So it frees that market. the The APR goes down, right? So that thirty percent or whatever. Like if Elixir wasn't there, like I mean, you guys, you can run the numbers on like like. Bluefin has not increased their incentives. They just side, they were just like, yeah, you guys can earn from, you know, like the, this market maker program. Um, and it's just like, oh, well, like now you guys are earning this, you know, we have what, I think like 30, 25, 30 million, I think of order book liquidity on, like, we're more than 70% of their order book liquidity. Like if you go to Bluefin, you make an order, like chances are you're trading against an Elixir order. Um, and all of that, and the APR is still like, 35%, right? So all of that has kind of come out of the pockets of like a bigger market maker that would have just been paid like 200 or 300% just to have like 50K of liquidity on the books or whatever, right? So um, it's already starting. Is it like the APR showing already from, is it, is it from the rebase from the uh, prep taxes? That's the, from the, the rewards. Yeah, that's, that's oh, from cool. the exchange, the liquidity provider. Oh, cool. So if you see like 35%, that's the exchange rewards. Okay, got it, got it. Nice. Um, how much dominance has uh, Elixir sort of accumulated? I know you touched on Bluefin, and um, I think I guess also quite bit on a few other top uh, perplexes. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, it's great. I think it's like Elixir is really kind of proliferated. I don't think there really are any like kind of like big competitors that we have like an eye out for that are doing what we're doing. I mean, we've, we operated, we built in stealth for like a year and a half, two years, just building this because we knew what we were building is pretty zero to one. Um, so, I mean, we have native integrations going live with, yeah, DYDX, Orderly, and, um, and Apex. So the next three, we've just been working to get those live. Um, we have like a really big, obviously, announcement um, that is going live in, in, in a month um, on that same note. But essentially, yeah, the, like we've, we've kind of all of the major order book based exchanges have their own native integrations going live um, of, of the Elixir network. And then, you know, I think just having like 250 to 300 million in this ELX ETH product is just going to, when we do go live and that converts, is going to be a great backstop of liquidity um, across these different exchanges. People can be able to point it or, you know, it'll essentially, you know, allow for these users to earn a share of these incentives across all the exchanges. Cool. So I have this question. I think you're probably the, one of the, the best person to ask, which is from, from someone who obviously worked with so many, uh, top order book style, uh, perp dances. Um, how do you rate or how do you describe this, um, different perp dances? Um, I think one obvious question people have is, are those like Binance, FTX? Um, is it just different UI or are they actually have different, um, trade offs, right? So, so maybe one has lower fee. But their execution speed uh, towards like liquidation or towards uh, stop loss is slightly lagged behind another one. Um, could you shed some light on that? 
Yeah, I mean, execution is getting pretty solid um, with these with these order book based exchanges, right? So the fact that a lot of these guys have off chain, I mean, the standard for order book based perpetuals exchanges is you have an off chain order matching, right? That settles on chain. That's kind of like the standard. Um, the really big ones end up launching their own chains, um, right? DYDX, like Hyperliquid, right? They're, they end up launching like their own chains, but the chains are th themselves are not like like they're they're just pretty much purpose built for that use case, right? Like I I'd be curious to see if like like Hyperliquid actually gets people building like I don't think I don't even I don't even know if it's part of their plan to have like DApps and like you know developers building like smart contracts and stuff on them. I mean maybe, but um, we'll have to see. But I think the actual appeal there, like the the, the tech is getting pretty close. Um, I think there are a lot of issues. I think the main ones are like liquidity, right? So if you're and it's also just like ease, right? If like a lot of the, the, the big traders that I know still are trading on centralized exchanges, but um, the reason for that is generally like liquidity is, is a big one. There's like concerns around like um, people, I mean, people, people trust Binance. Like people th don't think that like Binance is going to like snipe their, their liquidation levels if it gets close to a certain liquidation level. Um, whereas like they're, it's it's funny. There's a lot of these like order book le like leading order book exchanges. People kind of like won't really trust. They're like, oh, I don't really know, right? Like if I'm just gonna get like sniped, like if like say that I, you know, if I whatever Solana is at 150 and and my liquidation level is 148, like you know, there there is a natural incentive, especially if like you're running like a you know whatever, like you're essentially providing a lot of the liquidity on the exchange. Like why wouldn't you just liquidate it, take that money, put it into the, you know, into the bucket, right? So there are some concerns around that that I think people have. Um, but I do think that like, yeah, it's the, the, a lot of the, I mean, yeah, but buying, I mean, the, a lot of the traders are just on the centralized exchange side now. And I think a lot of that is just like convenience, ease, right? The, the amount of assets that you can buy, sell, you can withdraw it to the different chains, right? But sitting there with your ledger, clicking through, trying to do a bunch of like confirmate and waiting for confirmations and stuff. It's not like the best user experience. But I think people are starting to really move away from that. I think, yeah, I mean, each of the individual exchanges have like their own strengths, I think, and benefits relative to the others, um, which like, yeah, I mean, I, I have like a lot of thoughts on too. But I think just in general, like we are starting to see, I mean, obviously you don't want to have funds on a centralized exchange. That's like the big draw for a lot of these folks. But there are for big institutional players, there's like things like Copper Clearloop, there's Sifu, which are these OES solutions where you can have funds off the exchange, but have like a virtual, like, but you can trade with the balances on centralized exchanges, right? So then it's like, you kind of solve a lot of that issue. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I do think the industry is moving quite heavily towards DeFi, but I think you just have to remove a lot of the barriers towards like signing transactions and, and oh, like, you know, I, like, there's a lot of like farming that's happening, like especially yeah. with like hyper liquid or like we saw with Avo, right? There's just a lot of this farming going on too. So we'll just have to see. Which one? Which one do you think has currently has the least barrier to entry, or probably um, one of your uh, favorite? Oh, on the on the perp deck side. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, I'll be interested a, here. a few of them have a good shot at really hitting like public mainstream awareness because. Yeah, at the end of the day, if you can hit like clean UI, good liquidity, you're gonna retain a, a customer base, right? Um, and I think there's like, I mean, yeah, I mean, per, the, the the leaders right now are like DYDX and Hyperliquid. Those are really the two the two largest, right? I think it's um, yeah. I mean, you, we'll, we're just gonna have to see, I guess, what kind of happens. I know that like I'm very close with the DYDX folks, um, and like I think. Counter to what a lot of people are saying, it's not like Antonio's like, I know he stepped down as the CEO yesterday. That wasn't like, there, there's, he's not him like running away, like <laughs> from, from anything. Um, it's just like a part of this like larger vision that they have too. So it's going to be like, I'm like, I definitely wouldn't write those guys out. I think they have a, like, they have still like zero incentives, like completely zero incentives. And they're still like rivaling Hyperliquid in volume. Um, Hyperliquid's vault, like point program dropped off and their volume dropped by like six, whatever, 50% or whatever. 
but that's like every exchange, right? Like you can't even, you can't hold that against them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think Hyperliquid to give them props, they have a great product. Like it's something that everyone, even like other exchanges will tell me too. It's just, yeah, like Hyperliquid, they have a great product. They're very fast to add new markets. Um, and, and they're great at like listening to community on that side. Um, so yeah, I would say that one of those two is like pretty well poised to, to, you know, to, to really make an impact. Um, Apex has, has been dominating volumes. They have like no incentives still too. They have like a tiny little like trade intern program and they're doing like, you know, a billion plus a day and they have like a, a ton of unique traders. Um, and they just have a really large presence out in Asia, but like in the U S they're not that big. Right. But then there's like players that are really big in the U S and in Asia, they're not that big. Right. So there's, I think there's, there's a lot of parties that, um, I wouldn't write out yet, but, um, I, I think the, there's not like one clear winner by any shot. Yeah. What do you think the future of, uh, just overall at like, futures market will look like? Um, do you think water pool style and probably like GMS style or, or different style is going to, is going to coexist where, uh, in the future, we're probably going to have a clear winner. I think, I think a clear winner, I think order books, a thousand, it's not even close. Like we talked to a lot of the leading GLP style exchanges and all of them are moving to order books. Like it's not, in my opinion, it's not even like slightly close because counterparty, counterparty models, they, they struggle in a bunch of different ways without getting too much into it. You have like your supply, say that you, you create your, um, you, whatever you mint GLP, right? The, the issue with that is that, okay, you're backstopping liquidity, say on like BTC, ETH, and R or whatever. They can't go very far down the risk curve because if they add in 1,000, what a Pepe, M Pepe, some tiny little thing, and someone goes long 30X and makes $20 million, the entire like GLP is just destroyed, right? So you can't have like parties that like could potentially re-rate 10x and then have leverage on top of it, right? So it's like, it's not a scalable model. It's fully on chain. So people have to like, so then big traders can't even plug in by APIs, right? If you want to like, there, you can't, you, it's either just like, there, there's no order book. So you can't even see like levels or anything like that. So every professional trader that I talk to won't trade on like a GMX style. Um, and I'm not trying to rag on it. I just think when you, when you ask about the future of it, like, I think, I mean, because we, we talk to these guys all day and every single GLP, GMX style um, party is moving away from the counterparty AMM model and they're all going to order books. Like, so um, introducing limit orders, introducing like APIs and then it's like, oh, introducing our off-chain order matching. And then it's like, okay, then you're you just moved to the, the order book model. So look at like synthetics is like a good example. Sin Futures is adding limit orders. They're adding API support. They're going to be natively integrating Elixir, um, and they're on blast. Like they're they're great guys, um, and they have a great head on their shoulders. So, like, I mean, you just see across the board, like every single one of these guys. Um, you know, you'll see a pitch deck from a project, and they're raising for a GLP style, and then three months later, it's like, oh, we've moved to an order book, and it's like, yeah, it's it's just because it's it's better to have off. The last thing I'll mention too is that if you have if you have gas costs with orders, right, you have to quote wider. It's effectively like adding latency to the system. If you have to pay one penny, even if it's one penny, I mean we're we're processing like hundreds of I mean, because we have like eight order levels on each side for 30 pairs on an exchange for three exchanges, and we're updating it once a second, right? It does, it ends up being like, oh, well, it's, yeah, it's one penny, but at the end of the month, you look at it, it's like 45 grand or something, right? So it ends up, so what you do is you have to update less frequently, which means you have to quote wider, right? And so you're now you're updating once every five seconds and you're quoting every, you're quoting a certain spread, right? So then the order, then the trading. So one good example is like Drift. And like, I think they will probably end up moving. I mean, well, I, I'm, I'm not, we're not that close with them, but a lot of people have kind of ragged on them for their spreads. But the reason that the spreads are large is because you, even though it's on Solana, it's fully on chain. Like we love those guys. Like they, they're a great team, but like the issue is that they're facing is like, if you're a market maker, you're just like, you can't like, you, you just literally, you can only, okay, now I have to update once every three seconds instead of like, I mean, cause it, we, we only update once a second. Right. And that's like in, in HFT time, like that's why we have to quote slightly wider because we're only updating like every 0.9 seconds. 
like Wintermute or whatever is updating like four times, five, whatever, five times a second, right? So now they're going to five seconds too. So we're five seconds, they're five seconds. And then next thing you know, the spreads are wide. People are, you know, trying to like sign on their ledgers and they're paying like fees and they don't have enough gas. And it's just like, and then, oh, and then if it's fully on chain, now you have like, oh, you have a liquidation and it enters the block explorer. Like what is, like, is there MEV there? So it's just, yeah, I think 100% order books um, are, are definitely the future. Cool, because one thing I do like about JMAT style uh, perp dances is that uh, if you are LP, um, if you, if you look at like Jupiter's JLP, it's just being like up only and is, is quite lucrative for you to, uh, you know, uh, have a somewhat like a delta neutral position, but like keep adding on, um, you know, people down the tempo and they're not going to be outperforming, uh, like overall the market. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, I guess let's kind of provide a different angle, right? That, you can actually be participating in a water book and um, still having a, uh, you know, a, a decent return. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's really the end goal, right? It's like Elixir wants to be trustless infrastructure that exchanges and protocols can lean on to bootstrap liquidity to their order books. Like in a, yeah, in just fully trustless permissionless manner. Right. And I think that's like, I think it kind of solves the best, of both worlds, right? Where it's, you're able to, you know, you're able to operate in the most efficient trading environment, but you're also able to bring in capital from parties that want to supply liquidity to the order books and they're able to earn incentives and the exchange is able, the exchange is happy because they get way deeper books. They're getting way better efficiency on every dollar that they're paying out for liquidity. Like the market makers are happy because they get better execution too. Like even the market makers that are like, you know, Count, you know, whatever they, they're arming to Binance or whatever these 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 aggressive like trading firms and stuff like they're happy because now they have the orders um, and, and the necessary liquidity. Yeah, traders obviously get less slippage; they have better depth. Like the books are healthier, right? And then the yeah, LPs get a new yield source, so it's kind of like a win-win-win for everyone um, in solving this just like bottleneck that has been facing all order book based exchanges. Cool. Do you think in the future? Um, like all this, all this, uh, top, top, top order book style, um, DEXs is going to have a very similar prize and order book because of, um, protocols like, like Elixir. Or is it, you, you still do, you just, you, you still think that the funding raise is going to be different uh, across different, uh, perp DEXs? Um, what, what do you think, say, the end goal? Um, of Elixir achieves, like what will be the order book style perp dances, uh look like in terms of, you know, those things I mentioned? Like just the future of like what, what the, what an order book will look like in like a few yeah, years. Yeah, will they like look like the same or are there still going to be like a difference in funding rates and, and all that? Well, I think the, I think that's, it's a good question. I think Elixir enables a more efficient fundraising, like a more efficient trading environment on the actual DeFi side, right? So I think it would, it will allow for these like players who can do a basis trade, for example, right? So the, the classic basis trade is say that like funding is 10% over here and it's like minus 5% over here, whatever. So you can long here, yeah. short here and like pretty much collect that, that difference in basis, right? The, that is now possible because you have deeper liquidity on the books. So I think the future is all of these exchanges will have their own like Elixir integrations to essentially allow for users to supply. Elixir will be the trustless primitive powering these different order book based exchanges. And we allow for things like Athena to function, right? Where if they want to bring their USDE hedging flows to DeFi, like Elixir can power that, right? Like we, we essentially are the tech that can make that possible because now they can scale in a lot more size on like a DYDX or you know, a vertex or something like that, right? Because Elixir is is, is providing that liquidity, um, you know, to that actual exchange, right? So now, yeah, I think that's it's it's um it's a good question, I think. But um, yeah, I think the future of, of order books is just is like I think Elixir is just like an instrumental part of that because otherwise, right? If Elixir is gone, then it's like these reads. I mean, yeah, then you get the it's just a very it's very difficult for these exchanges to bootstrap liquidity, right? They're trying to like 
launch their own like ways and it ends up not really working. And then like people don't really trust it because it's their own. Oh, do I really want to supply liquidity? Am I, you know, do I trust this thing? Right. Um, so it's just, yeah, I think, I think Elixir is kind of a fundamental, um, no matter how you view the future of, of order book exchanges, like Elixir is a fundamental part. Well, thank you so much for coming to this podcast, Philip. Um, it's certainly a very meaningful uh, conversation, not only about Elixir, but I learned a lot about you know how market making works and uh, the future of perpetual uh, debts. So thanks for coming. Do you have any yeah, final message for our audience? No, nothing else. Um, feel free to follow along um, on our Twitter. We're at Elixir on Twitter. Feel free to join our Discord, um, our Telegram as well. We'd love to uh, to welcome all you guys. And, and yeah, definitely just... I would, yeah, I'd, I'd follow the Twitter to keep posted on the latest and greatest, but we have some big announcements coming soon. Our main it's in August, so um, things will really be ramping up. But um, yeah, thank you, Sean, for having me. Likewise. Right,